try something different tonight. I thought I would try out a book review. So what you should see over my left shoulder here is a book by Susan Jacoby called uh, The Age of American Unreason. This is a book that was published in 2008, and uh, I think the title pretty much says it all. So I'll have the book up here for a while, but then I thought I'd throw in some footage, uh, kind of continuing my rural America trip home, uh, continuing up Highway 85 north of Belfouche, South Dakota. And uh, I usually don't show that part of my trips to South Dakota, mostly because, well, it's long. <laughs> and uh, most viewers don't find it terribly interesting when compared to the Black Hills. It's like, oh, Black Hills, so pretty. Oh, prairie, yay. And I, I will admit I feel that let down when I head home too. So, yeah. So I'm not going to do this totally off the cuff. I do have a script here. I'm going to try really hard to make good eye contact, but I do need to use my script also, and I don't have a teleprompter, so uh, you get what you get. <laughs> uh, also, I'm using uh, the camera that usually records my writing samples because it's less work to set it up, so I, uh, yeah, that's where I went. <laughs> so, Age of American Unreason, I actually first ran into Susan Jacoby. I watched her, uh, it was on a video, um, what was his name? Bill Moyers had interviewed Zach Coplin, who was a high school kid, although he's out of high school now and not a kid. Uh, but at the time, he was a high school kid in Louisiana who was very, very offended by Louisiana attempting to inject creationism to its science program. Uh, and then she followed him and uh, spoke basically on the same topic. And I thought, wow, she's very articulate. Uh, and says things very well in a way that I wish I could, because I kind of can sound like a dumbass sometimes. See, I just swore. Uh, any of my students are watching, that's one of many reasons why you'll never see one of these in school. But anyway, uh, so what she's all about in this book is this whole idea that, uh, um, and, and I actually did a quote about this uh, Isaac Asimov a few weeks ago in a pen review by, uh, oh, what was it, the Pilot Custom 823. In fact, I didn't plan this. This is off script already. So I'm going to read the quote to you because uh, there is no camera here anymore. Uh, so I did a re-review of the Pilot Custom 823, and I wrote this as my quote from Isaac Asimov. There is a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there always has been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. Isaac Asimov. So uh, I ran into this book, and I thought, hey, I'm going to give it a try. And it is an interesting read. I... Uh, don't expect you know, the, don't expect this to be so much of a book review, although that's what I'm calling it as a book response. Uh, I would suggest reading the book. There's my review. It's a good book. Uh, a little out of date. A lot has changed in the internet world since 2008, which is uh, you know the weakness of any form of published media. Uh, I'm sure this video will be obsolete, and people will be looking at this and. Oh my gosh, what awful video on that. It's only 1080? Oh my gosh. You know, technology and society change. And that just continues forever. So, uh, I guess if I wanted to sum up what she talks about in this book, first of all, lowbrow interests. Uh, that's her term. That's not a term I typically use. Uh, lowest common denominator and then uh, short attention spans. And uh, she talks about that in the present day, but she does, what's interesting is she goes into the past and show, talks about what, in her views, with plenty of references, would be the roots of these things. Um, I, I would just ask, was there ever really a golden age? And I don't know that she ever really cited a golden age. She cited when uh, certain things were better, but she also did a good job of debunking a lot of what was going on in those times, too, and showing that, yeah, <laughs> there wasn't really a golden age. Because I, I, I get tired of people looking back to a golden age. There never was one. There never will be. Um, if there is one, after saying never, 
Uh, if there is one, we're living in it. I mean, and there's a lot of problems today. There always will be. Um, but but she claims that there was a time when intellectual pursuits were more respected. You know, it's possible. Um, and she cites a lot of older books as example of more highbrow literature. And, uh, you know, that modern readers won't sit still for these. And to which I say, yeah, you're right. Um, to which I also say, some of these older writers just needed a good editor. I mean, this is going to be heresy to a couple J.R.R. Tolkien fans. But I personally think J.R.R. Tolkien could have really benefited from an editor. Uh, like the whole bit about Tom Bombadil. He, he's a popular character. I remember liking him when I was a kid. But what was the point of that? How did that advance the plot? Um, just a lot of things like that that it really could have benefited from an editor. Um, so I won't claim that books used to be better. Um, I, I will claim that lowbrow literature and lowbrow anything is more common now so we'll get into that here um, and i would just point out that historically we have distrusted smart people uh, think of adlai stevenson's presidential campaign 1952 and 1956 both both times for the democrats he ran against dwight eisenhower uh, Dwight Eisenhower had the whole, hey, I'm a general from the war thing going on. He also had the we like Ike or I like Ike thing going on. So catchy slogan. Um, Richard Nixon has actually disparaged him as being an, an egghead. And uh, egghead isn't a compliment. Uh, it, it's saying he's smart as though that's a bad thing. Uh, people criticized Obama as being too smart. Uh, one of the things people liked about, say, George Bush, who she talks about in the book, uh, because he was somebody you'd want to sit down and have a beer with versus Al Gore. And yeah, Al Gore had didn't present well socially. I, I will concede that openly and willingly. Uh, and, well, <laughs> I voted for Bush. I, w I hate to admit it now, but I did. And uh, anyway, so she, I don't want to retrace all the history she gets into because she has a lot of history she goes into. So I want to just cite a couple of things, kind of things that intersect with my own interests. Uh, one of the things she talked about was the Scopes trial of 1925. Now, if you're not familiar with it, this is what put... Uh, Dayton, Tennessee on the map. Uh, Dayton, Tennessee is not a real huge town. It's probably bigger than where I live, but it, no, not big. Uh, but there was a substitute teacher there who, uh, there, there are people saying that this was actually kind of a setup to, to get a whole publicity thing going on, but whatever. He, he was asked to teach a, a biology and teach evolution, which was against Tennessee law at the time. And so both sides brought in big high-level lawyers, uh, famous lawyers, um, and to, to argue the case, and you, you can read all that. I, I don't want to get into the technicalities of the case. I didn't even write down the lawyers' names, but fun fact, there are monuments to both of them now in front of that old courthouse. There was a big controversy over having the, the guy taking the anti-creationism side, uh, but He's up there now, too, and I think, honestly, both lawyers deserve to be there because this was a discussion that the country needed to have and which the country is still having, which I'll come back to that in a minute. But anyway, the Scopes trial was really about science and reason versus religious dogmatic belief. And it, of course, the side of science and reason lost and... Uh, I think the judge took the side of science and reason because the fine he imposed as punishment was just patently ridiculous. It was so small. So uh, the modern version of this actually would be from 2005, which is three years before the book was published. And right now I'm not remembering if she referenced this or not. I'm thinking she must have, but... I read so many things that they all kind of run together, and I wrote all these notes after reading the book, so it's more about 
large scale impressions rather than individual specific details. But uh, this one's personal to me because my home state is Pennsylvania. And in 2005, there was a trial. Uh, it's called, I wrote down the name here, Kitzmiller versus Dover Area School District. Uh, what it was is the modern version of science and reason versus creationism. Except they don't call it creationism anymore. Now they call it intelligent design. Uh, what that means is they're saying that uh, there has to have been a designer behind it all. Oh, I wonder who the designer is. You don't mean God, do you? Not, and not just any God. I mean, we're not talking Vishnu or Allah. We're talking the Christian God. Yeah, th that's what it is. And uh, the side of science and reason won this time. Now, what these are really showing is, first of all, the growth of the evangelical movement. Um, and the evangelical movement is very anti-intellectual. These are the people such as Ken Ham, who believe in a truly literal interpretation of the Bible, as in, the earth is 6,000 years old. Yes, there really was a worldwide flood. And some family, during the genocide by this malicious god, got in their little wooden boat with two of every single species. Oops, sorry, they used the word kind. Because that doesn't have a rigorous scientific definition. They can hide behind it and weasel it into whatever works for them. But anyway, every single pair of kinds, except for the special ones where they had, what, seven pairs or something. Oh, and dinosaurs. But Ken Ham will say, but it's baby dinosaurs, so it's okay, because they're small, because babies are cute. Um, anyway, that... And they will claim this in the face of clear evidence. I was looking at a website just tonight where their response to pictures of rock layers that date back millions of years was to say, clear evidence of a worldwide flood, because how else would oceans have deposited all this in the middle of a continent? Oh, where I live, southwestern North Dakota, we are digging up fossils of aquatic dinosaurs. This used to be under the ocean. And uh, your creationists will say evidence of a worldwide flood. Your scientists will say, oh, evidence that continents have moved around and been lifted up. So uh, what I'm coming down to here is this evangelical thing is a symptom of something larger, which is distrust of experts. Now, if you want to know what's what's causing that pain in your shoulder, I've got one right now, actually, in this shoulder. Uh, are you going to go over to your neighbor, Joe Bob, and say, well, my shoulder hurts, and Joe Bob figured out, or are you going to go to a doctor? I'd go to a doctor. I have been to the doctor, and I know what's wrong, and it's because you can't see it because it's off screen, but over to my right, there's a flight of stairs from the upstairs down to my basement that is about like a ladder. It is uneven. And the steps are all very narrow. And several years ago, I fell down the flight of steps. And this arm kind of went up like this. And uh, I cracked the ball off my humerus. Luckily, there was a tiny fragment of it still attached. Or I would have been in a world of hurt. <laughs> and, uh, you know, every so often it pains me. And uh, this happens to be that time. I'm thinking, because I haven't done anything too wild with it, I'm thinking it's paining me because I slept on it wrong. But uh, anyway, I went to a doctor back then, got a CAT scan, and you know, went through all the treatment and everything to get it to heal properly, rather than just relying on the people telling me to tough it out. Well, I'm glad I didn't tough it out now that I found out how little of the bone remained attached to the rest of the bone, because that would have been easy to snap off. But uh, we distrust experts. Uh, that said Isaac Asimov quote. And... What do I mean? Well, websites that give medical cures. Uh, the anti-vaxxer movement. Uh, the people who say, oh, the moon landing was a hoax. Uh, climate change deniers. Um, the creationists. These are all people who are de denying the evidence. And these are denying experts. Because who, really? Am I an expert on evolution? No. My degree is in physics, and I don't have a career in physics, I have a career in education. So, uh, 
you know, I'm not an expert on any of those fields, and I know that. And that's why I use experts. So that would be a big thing. And this isn't just on the right. I intentionally included the anti-vaxxer movement because there is a large segment of that on the right, but there's also a large segment of it on the left. Uh, and on the left, and I was happy Susan Jacoby got into this, she also talks about some of the leftist movements that are anti-intellectual. One of the ones, and she brings up the 60s, because everybody likes to blame the 60s, and just uh, kind of this cultural thing that to uh, worship youth and uh, distrust authority just in general. And, uh, you know, I, I work with youth. Yes, they can have valuable insight. Yes, they can have new ways of looking at things. But one of the things youth lacks is experience. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I would suggest reading her book to get the full case on that. I want to move on a little bit to more modern phenomena. Now, she talks a little bit about uh, entertainment. She, she makes a big deal about TV, uh, and I, I think that's, that's worthwhile. Uh, there is a lot of potential in TV up until, well, about a week ago. <laughs> Sorry, uh, current events caught up with me before I got this video filmed. Uh, I, I would have cited the Charlie Rose show on PBS as a good example of, you know, you can have good intelligent discussions with somebody. Uh, sadly, over this past week, it was revealed that Charlie Rose definitely has a dark side. So I, uh, no, there goes my example that I had written down when I wrote this outline. But on the other s side of that, we have, okay, David Pakman. I didn't write him down. He's not as big a media figure as Charlie Rose was. Um, he's also never gotten in trouble for creepy sexual harassment in a way that I just can't even imagine ever doing to anybody. But, you know, that aside, David Pakman does, he's uh, on YouTube, does pretty good uh, interviews. And you can find it out there. It's just not in the mainstream media. Uh, what passes for entertainment, I'll come back to the news media here in a second, uh, reality TV. You know, when I moved to North Dakota back in 1999, I didn't get TV. At the time, it was just kind of a, oh, I don't get paid until the middle of September, and it's August now, and I just spent a whole bunch of money getting out here, and I have to support myself for, for all that time until I get paid? Well, that's why I didn't get TV in the first place, because I could have gotten cable or satellite or whatever. And uh, it just became a habit after that, and I still don't have TV, although I do have the Internet. Uh, which I didn't have till I moved here. But uh, I do know what reality TV is. I've seen some of it. Uh, I will admit I have streamed a really sad TV show <laughs> called Hoarders. Uh, it fascinates me. I'm actually looking at writing a book uh, after I finish the current one involving a character who is a older woman who's a hoarder and overweight and dealing with a lot of issues and I'm actually going to cast her as the heroine and uh, she'll be kind of a challenge so so part of that was interesting just to get some ideas of family dynamics but uh, not a lot of intellectual content there now I've read some interesting books by psychologists which I don't have any down here to tell you the exact titles or authors about hoarding because it does fascinate me I can see tendencies toward that in myself uh, but I also know that I'm uh, fairly good at self-correcting. So, but uh, yeah, but reality TV is one um, you know, because a lot of that is whenever you watch that, you know, hoarders, you don't see the whole process. You don't see all the therapy. You don't see all the time taken. They compress it into an hour, and it's already artificially compressed from what it should be. And they don't show all the peaceful times, all the discussion. They just show the drama parts where they're screaming at each other. And that's what reality TV looks for. Uh, there's TV shows, oh shoot, 
some chef anyway he does shows where he goes into restaurants and tells them what they're doing wrong or uh i guess he hires chefs and he does a reality tv show where they compete to be his top chef and you know i've watched bits of that and just like wow all manufactured and heavily edited you could come into my classroom with a camcorder tape a whole day in my classroom you could cast me as the most amazing, inspiring teacher ever. Or you could edit the footage in a different way and cast me as the most god-awful, horrible, hateful, incompetent teacher ever with the exact same day. It's all in how you edit it. Do you want me to be the hero? Do you want me to be the villain? In either case, you don't get the context, you don't get the full story. And who's going to watch a full day of my classroom? I mean, boring. Sorry. That, that sounds like I'm really criticizing my teaching, but I'm not. I mean, it's just not interesting to the TV market. So, uh, you know, when John Stossel, for example, wants to show why we need to have competition in schools and vouchers and charter schools and all that and destroy public education... He's not going to show U.S. education in its best light. He's going to go into some school on the last day of school when they're done with everything and show them goofing off. That's just what they do. Uh, so that's real, reality TV. Um, in general, our TV shows aren't terribly threatening. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, and I'm sort of limited here, but I'm thinking back in my childhood, you know, Growing Pains, although Kirk Cameron's turned out to be quite interesting since then. Um, family Ties, uh, Cosby Show, Bill Cosby has also turned out to be quite interesting, speaking of things going on, like Charlie Rose, only, yeah. Um, th those were pretty much non-threatening. Now they may have pushed a few buttons, you know, the whole idea, oh, a black family where they're professionals. <gasps> um, they weren't pushing buttons the way they were a few years before that. You know, that, that fad had kind of passed. Uh, but in general, our TV is non-threatening. Um, especially, it doesn't want to threaten core beliefs. Now, a few things, they'll push the envelope. I know there was a TV show a number of years ago about... Uh, Oh, what was he? A gay man and his, not girlfriend, female roommate anyway. And uh, that, you know, pushed a few buttons at the time. I remember when the Simpsons pushed buttons. At the time, I couldn't watch it, so I had no idea what that was all about. Um, you, you, occasionally, people get upset over something offensive. But really, we don't have anything really pushing us to think or think differently or reevaluate our beliefs. And we don't have a lot that's educational. Something that happened to me this fall, and I wish I'd written it on my outline, but you know, I always get off my script. I, I, I did an activity in my earth science class with the eighth graders about building an underground shelter. Uh, so they had to look at rock types. They had to do tests on rocks you know, to find out what are their strengths, um, different properties of the rocks. They used our classroom to estimate approximately what size should the cavern be for the people in this fictitious state. Uh, where are we going to put it on the map? You know, a whole bunch of things they had to look up. And while I was uh, doing that unit, I ran across, and I wish I'd written it down, uh, an interesting underground city in Turkey. And what it was is it was designed for to be a really large shelter. I mean, 20,000 people or so. This guy found it in the 1960s as he tried to enlarge his basement. And, oh, yeah, it's way bigger than I thought it would be. Uh, so he gets in this underground city. It was designed, you know, very narrow entrances so any invaders would have to come in one by one so they could be killed. Uh, storage for months underground of food and water. Uh, wells that wouldn't be poisoned from above. And uh, so I thought, I need to find a good video because this is like perfectly what they're doing. Only it's already been done. So I went looking. I found a video on History Channel. Well, the first four minutes were pretty good. I gave diagram of the city and everything. I was just like, yes! <laughs> and then the ancient aliens came into it. I'm sorry. 
when you start spouting off aliens, until you can give me evidence for aliens, I'm not going to take you seriously. And, uh, yeah, so I couldn't use that. that I mean, do you, if I show that to 8th graders, they don't necessarily have the critical thinking skills to realize, oh, this video is entertainment, it's not educational. And it's appealing to those base, lowbrow interests, people that think, just spouting something off is actually equivalent to having evidence. Um, you know, I when I did my whole thing about the layers of the Earth, and we did a little simulation of how, we, how do we know that there's a liquid core. Yes, I do know the center of the Earth is solid, but the liquid around it, how do we know about that based on how the P waves move through the Earth? And I had a whole great simulation on that. Get done with all that, and this kid says, Well, I read that the Earth is hollow, how do we know there's not people living underground in the hollow earth? I'm just like, oh, because there's no evidence for it, kid. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of what she's getting into. Um, news media. I can't stand, you know, I was talking about Charlie Rose as a good interviewer, David Pakman. Uh, what I liked about Charlie Rose and I like about David Pakman is they will let the person have their say and they don't just try and get a sound bite in they actually take the time to do a proper more thorough interview David Pakman will even split his interviews up so he can do a full interview if it fits but then you watch other people like Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson or Bill O'Reilly or even some of your local people and what they'll do is still interrupt their interviewee. They'll talk over them. The, the interview is not, let's have a discussion. Let's see what you feel. Uh, let, let's get your point of view. It's all about the anchor's own opinion. Well, I know what their opinions are. Why are you bothering to get somebody in to interview if you're not going to interview them? Occasionally they'll get a guest on who who knows the game and and can get their point across anyway but again it shouldn't be a contest that's very lowbrow this is a chance to get an alternative point of view and no not all points of view are equal uh she didn't really get into this but you know an anti-vaxxer sorry doesn't have science on their side a climate change denier does not have science on their side a creationist does not have climate does not have science on their side. So no, I'm not going to take you as seriously as I'm going to take the scientist. That's just how it is. Sorry. And, uh, and so, the, yeah, that's one of my problems with the news media. Or, or they'll have a debate, and rather than it be a discussion, it's shouting over each other. Or look at our sad, sad presidential debates. And the questions the news media would ask you know, what are your feelings about what this candidate said about you? Who the hell cares? I mean, yes, we had some candidates saying some pretty stupid stuff. I personally don't think Ted Cruz's dad was one of the people who killed JFK. Just saying. He's a wackadoodle, but he wasn't an assassin. <laughs> and uh, I won't say that the Democratic Party was any better because... Yeah, both parties ended up with probably the worst person nominated. Um, uh, one of the things we're seeing more and more is shorter attention spans. I deal with that as a teacher. You know, our uh, fax teacher was talking about this. The other, she's my age, so, you know, uh, talking about this the other day that back when we were in school, we would watch film strips, which isn't what you're seeing now. It was literally film in a projector and would advance one slide at a time while the tape or the record player played the sound to go with it. And uh, I can't imagine asking my students to sit through one of those now. But back in the 80s and 90s when we were in school, heck, that's what we did. I'm actually a Generation X, so we're considered the last generation that grew up without technology easily available. I did not take a cell phone. Well, I'm 42. I still don't own a cell phone, but that's another story. But I did not take technology to school. I remember in third grade, we bought the school bought its very first computer. It was an Apple IIe, and it was wheeled from classroom to classroom so we could all share it. 
yeah, I hardly got to use it. Our computer lab when I was in eighth grade was TRS-80s from Radio Shack. And then I got to high school, that computer lab in the high school was all Apple IIe's with black screen and green text, and that was it. Yeah. So when I got to college and got a laptop, Compact Contura, with Windows 3.1 and 4 megabytes of memory and 130-something megabytes hard drive, whoa, baby, I was in heaven. <laughs> uh, I showed that. I still have it. I, I show it to my students, and they all just look at it and go, really? <laughs> But uh, we're getting shorter attention spans, and Twitter would be a perfect example of this. How do you have a discussion in 140 characters? There's nothing deep gets developed in 140 characters. 140 characters is great for things like, Wasky Squirrel is uploading a book review tonight. I'm not impressed with Twitter. I, I have a Twitter account, but I almost never use it. Uh, it's just useless. Um, we like our pithy little quotes. Memes are really popular, and I just can't believe how much I see on Facebook people posting memes to support their political side. It's just like, no, one little factoid that we don't even know where you got it from in a, in a picture to make whoever side you're on look stupid is not an argument at all. Um movies you watch older movies and part of that was technological but you see how this has basically been one continuous take because i'm looking at you instead of doing my usual driving videos where i'm off screen and i can film it in several sittings one continuous take uh, you watch old movies much longer takes modern movies we have to keep switching camera angles and we have to keep switching cameras and direction and we have to keep something going on all the time um it's the attention span thing and i would give you as an example and <laughs> this is what susan jacoby would call lowbrow entertainment but well, let's take the terminator movies so uh take the first one yes forget special 80s special effects we all know <laughs> um for what they had at the time, that was pretty good. I, I'm not talking special effects. Look at how they built up the tension. Look at how they built it up. Uh, the action was kind of a long, drawn-out thing. Yes, everybody remembers the I'll be back and all that kind of stuff. But there's a lot going on, and there, the sustained attention is necessary. Uh, Terminator 2, much better special effects. We start relying on special effects more. But even then... Some story, we had the, that's the one to the little boy, right? We had the nifty little relationship between the little boy and the android that attacked his mother or something. So that was better. I mean, that was okay, I guess. And then uh, as you go on, it's more and more special effects. We have to keep raising the stakes. Okay, last time we had the android turns into blobs of mercury. Now we got to up it some more. So, you, so the android now can take over machines. And we've got lots and lots of machines flying down the city streets, tearing up buildings as they fly down the streets. You know, it, it all becomes spectacle rather than story. And uh, they have to top themselves. And I think for all of its faults, and I'm not going to deny, deny them, the first Terminator was a pretty good movie. Sorry if that puts me among the lowbrow, but I kind of liked it. Um, and I'll just say, people don't like to be threatened. You know, you, you say something like, well, how do we know that there really was this Jesus fella? How do we know there was this Allah? Oh boy. <laughs> Uh, people aren't open to that. Then I'll just say, here's another one. How many people do this? Read. I always think it's sad when I walk into somebody's house, especially if they have kids, and there are no books. Uh, there might be some children's books, but no adult books. So these kids are growing up not knowing that adults read. Adults pick up ideas. A book is a powerful way to really engage because it forces you to focus your attention. 
If you're distracted while you're reading, you're not picking things up. And when, you, when you're on the computer reading a website, you're like, oh, that reminds me of this. I'm going to go look this up. And you're constantly distracted. Books, you don't have that. Now, I will admit, I do like the Kindle. I was very sad. I have, I guess, one of the last keyboard Kindles. Um, it died, unfortunately. I would like to replace it. I did like reading on that. I will concede that. Uh, that was wonderful, especially for travel, but just a nice way to read. Uh, so, I don't know. I may take a break from some fountain pens and buy myself another Kindle. But, anyway, uh, that immersion, the reading is a... It, yes, there, there's some passivity to it. Yes, there's all kinds of levels of reading. Yes, there's the same bullshit ancient alien stuff in reading as you can find on the History Channel. And yet, if you, you engage more, and when you read, what you should be doing is doing some critical thinking. Like, well, why did they say that? You know, I know as I read this, I would read something, and then I'd have to page back and say, Wait a second, how did that follow from that? With this video, yeah, I guess you could rewind. I actually did that with a video I watched today. But it's not the same as a book. That Just that level of engagement. And let's be honest. Watching a video like this, I'll bet you zoned out a few times already. Because I've run this way past your attention span. That's what we do. Uh, with the book, when I do that, I can go back and reread it. With this, I just with movies or videos in general, I'm just like, oh, well, I missed that. Oh, well. So a lot of people just aren't reading. I, I think it's sad that we have adults in this country who don't read a single book. Who don't read at all. Even trashy romance novels, they just don't read. That is so sad. And of course, ideally, we'll be open to new ideas. That doesn't mean we accept everything we hear. It just means open to it and hear, willing to hear it instead of being threatened by it. Um, you know, there's nothing noble about having a fundamentally held belief. Because what if that fundamentally held belief is wrong? You should always be open to questioning it. Um, and here's a good one that I was thinking about. I, I've thought about this a lot. How many Christians have actually read their own Bible? I mean, or Muslims have read their own Quran or whatever. I, I was raised in the Christian faith, so that's the one I naturally default to. A lot of them have not. Now here's this book that supposedly comes from God, yet they've not read it. They've probably read their couple of little favorite verses, you know, little heartwarming verses. Uh, maybe the God hates gays verses, and then that's about it. They don't know what's in their own book. And those that do read it often won't read it with a critical eye. They won't say, whoa, 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 what's this story in Judges 19? What's this whole deal about this guy and his concubine staying at someone's house? The men of the city want to come rape the guy, and the guy says, oh, you can't rape me. Here, have my concubine. So they rape her instead, and uh, she crawls back to the house in the morning after having been gang raped, and dies, hopefully, and he cuts up her body into pieces and sends it to the tribes of Israel. I mean, what the hell is the point of that story? And by the way, gang rape seems to be a thing because, you know, that's uh, what happened with Lot. You know, the angels came and visited and said, hey, yeah, we're going to do bad, we're going to destroy Sodom, and and uh, the people of the city came to his house and they all said, hey, let's rape your, your visitors. And he says, no, 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 you can't rape my visitors. Here, have my virgin daughters instead. And uh, apparently he was the good man. And then later on he escaped with his virgin daughters to uh, a cavern and his virgin daughters got him drunk so that he'd get them pregnant. So, ah, <laughs> read the thing. So, uh, yeah, and how many of us are willing to question our own religion? That's hard. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd suggest reading books, intelligent books. Yes, sometimes the trash is a good time filler. Uh, but 
stuff that'll feed your brain also would be really important. Uh, higher quality journals and magazines. You know, The Economist is actually a decent source of news, especially it's from a perspective you don't see here. Uh, if I read more German, I think Der Spiegel would be a pretty good journal also. Uh, my German isn't up to that. Uh, you want to get your diverse views and ideas. And of course, don't be afraid to fact check. Here's one that has been going around here just lately. Uh, it's been going around lately that there was a 260 found... Sorry, it's like 8.30 and I... Yeah. <laughs> this 264-pound wolf shot in Watford City. So, what really caught my eye, because I do know for a fact wolves wander through here. And they don't live here, but they'll wander through once in a while. But I thought, 264 pounds? That's a big wolf. So I fact-checked it. Well, it turns out that same picture appeared in an Idaho hunting forum in 2013. Now, I don't know the original source of the picture. I don't care. But right there, debunked. A little critical thinking. Just because you read it doesn't mean it's true. Fact check. Uh, now some things, like if I told you, well, I went out to Ponderosa tonight for supper, you, you don't need to fact check that because who the hell cares? By the way, there is no Ponderosa near here. I did not go out to Ponderosa for supper. I microwaved a casserole that was in my refrigerator for supper. And, uh, of course, don't be afraid of a little bit of nuance. First of all, there, there's very little that's truly black and white. Most things are shades of gray, and you don't even know exactly which shade of gray it is. Uh, second of all, it does take time to consider an idea. Uh, we love people who are decisive. Those are people we like as leaders. People say, this is how it is. This is what I say. Let's go. That's easy to follow. You know, I always, when I judge a speech, because I occasionally judge speech competitions, you know, I'll tell them, take charge of the room, take a step forward, be assertive. Uh, and, and I try to do some of that with my classroom too. But at the same time, while that can uh, inspire followers, what if what you're saying is wrong? You know, you need to be willing to take the time to consider before you start spouting off and taking the lead. Uh, you know, we love pithy comebacks. Uh, we, we love, you know, Crooked Hillary, uh, Donnie Tiny Hands, and those kind of things. We're not as impressed by people who think Adlai Stevenson was insulted as an egghead, as though it's a bad thing that he thinks. Um, we don't like listening to nuanced speeches quite often. They lose our attention. Uh, we don't, you know, nuanced discussions aren't as much fun. Uh, people taking the time to really research, we don't like that. And another thing we don't like is, you know, when you have a discussion, it doesn't just involve getting my views out, it also involves listening. You know, what is the other person saying? If all you care about is what you think or what you have to say, what's the point of having a discussion? Just give a speech. Uh, we like good slogans. And uh, often a strong appearance matters more than the actual content. And I just can't believe that people were actually asking, who would you rather have a beer with? George Bush or Al Gore? That doesn't matter who I want to have a beer with. Who's the better leader? Now I will say, George Bush, right after 9-11, when he gave his little speech at the Twin Towers, that was very good, that's very inspiring. That's something a good leader can do. But the decision-making can't be done that way has to be very nuanced and slow and careful. Once in a while you have to act quickly, but uh, 
more often it's better to research and know your facts so that if you have to act quickly, you have that background of knowledge to call upon. Which is another reason to be well-read and well-versed in a lot of different areas. You know, I, this week, had to do a plumbing repair. Well, I know enough as able to do it. Uh, rather than wait for the plumber to get here or just run out there and say, well, I'll get, I'll figure it out somehow. I actually researched it and then I used my baseline knowledge to do the repair and so far successfully, thank God. Uh, and then just my last thing here is we often tend to identify with a tribe over particular ideas. You know, if you don't label ideas as Democrat or Republican, you often get quite different survey results from if you say the Democrats suggest or the Republicans suggest um, I, I was watching a little clip of a, I think it was Fox actually, was going around to college campuses and saying some part of the Republican tax plan was actually Bernie Sanders' proposal. And then they, they crowing about the fact these college students are all like, oh yeah, I like that. And they're actually liking Donald Trump's idea. What they left out was this was actually one of the areas of overlap between Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. It was something about small businesses. I don't remember exactly. If, if it's not too late, I may insert the reference here. If not, we'll just let it go. But anyway, I've come to the end of this, and I'm just looking at the time, and uh, <laughs> that was longer than expected. But uh, I would suggest reading Susan Jacoby, The Age of American Unreason. Uh, if you're like me, one of the things you find is there's just too many books and not enough time to read them all. So, uh, you know, put it on your list of books you might want to read someday. And uh, hopefully you'll get to a fraction of them. Uh, yeah, and if you don't have a bookshelf in your house, I hope you have a very full Kindle. If you don't have either one, start. Read. There is a world out there in books. So don't expect this to be a regular feature where I regularly review books. Uh, I don't, not all of them I read are worth reacting to. And uh, I read also for entertainment. But I expect this to be an occasional thing. So I uh, hope this is interesting and uh, I thank you for watching. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.